But the thing that everybody around here is so afraid of is that if Mumia gets a new trial, Mumia walks. He didn't do it the first time. And now he's got good lawyers. He's got the best lawyers. He'd never get convicted of this twice. He didn't do it the first time. It was a frame-up job, and this would be so easy for an intelligent lawyer, a competent lawyer, to show. I didn't think that the uh, politicization in this case could go that far, it could go as high as the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. And I was wrong. Back in uh, 1989, when Mamiya's case was before the Philadelphia Supreme Court, we had a very similar thing happen. They had the, his, he claimed that, his attorneys claimed that Prosecutor McGill used improper summary summation during the guilt phase of his trial by telling the jury that uh, they would there would be appeal after appeal and then nobody had actually been sentenced and he'd been actually been executed in Pennsylvania for many many years and so that kind of language has a tendency to lessen the jury's sense of responsibility the Supreme the Philadelphia Supreme Court in a, in a case a year before that had said that McGill was the prosecutor same prosecutor same type of language that was in that case, they ordered a new trial. They threw out the verdict because they said he compromised the jury with that kind of comment. Then Mumia comes up, makes the same case, virtually the same language, and this time they say no. Another a couple of years go by, another case comes up, uh, and then they say, well, from now on, we're not going to allow any summation to, to make any reference to the. Uh, process. So here we had him ordering a new trial in one case, saying no in Mumia's case, and in th the third case prohibiting it for life for any future DA in Philadelphia to use, or any DA in the state of Pennsylvania to use, uh, references to the appeal process during the summation to the jury. Okay, that was at the state level. The third Circuit's kind of done the same thing. They have a number, they are big in precedence there. They live by presidents. But in a case they had in 2004 called Holloway versus Horn, a by the way, a Philadelphia case with strikingly similar characteristics to the Mumia case, they found that the prosecutor's use of peremptory challenges to exclude otherwise qualified blacks from the jury was discriminatory. It was what they call a Batson, that's B-A-T-S-O-N, a Batson violation. The Supreme Court ruled in 1986 that prosecutors who remove people for racial purposes, that's, that's unconstitutional, and a new trial is warranted. So, Mumia's claim was that the prosecutor in his trial, Joe McGill, who had a record of purging blacks from previous juries, had done exactly that at his own trial, where McGill did use 10 of his 15 peremptory challenges that he used. He had 20, but he used 15. He used 10 of them to strike blacks. So that's a strike rate of 66.7%. Now the Third Circuit in the Holloway versus Horn case said, uh, where well, the strike rate was like, oh, 11 out of 13 or 12 out of 13. It was a higher strike rate, but still 66.7% is a very high strike rate. So in that case, they said you didn't you didn't need uh, to know the composition of the jury. Well, in the Mumia case, the judges in the this was a two to one decision. The majority opinion said if you don't know the composition, the racial composition of the entire jury pool, then the strike rate is kind of hard to figure. It doesn't make much sense. The 66.7 is that high, or is that in fact what the jury pool was? Well, there's very little chance in the city of Philadelphia that you could get a jury pool anywhere near 66.7% black. You could easily get one 66.7% white. So that was a facetious line of, you know, I don't know what you call it, defense for the, a line of reasoning for the chief, this was the chief judge, Judge Sirica, to, to rule the way he did. So they take this, they say because they didn't know the composition of the jury, therefore you can't enter a Batson claim. 
Well, the Supreme Court never said that in 1986. The Third Circuit has never said that. In fact, they said just the opposite in Holloway. They said you don't need to know the composition of the jury pool to have a Batson claim. Now, all a Batson claim does, it doesn't get you a new trial. It just gets you the case remanded back to the federal district court, which happens to be here in Pennsylvania, be by Judge Yon, and he'd have an evidentiary hearing, hearing to see, to hear the prosecutor's explanations for why he excluded the 10 blacks that he did exclude. If he could show the Judge Yon that these 10, these 10 preemptions were not race based, they were neutral in terms of race, Mumia's case is over. There's no Batson claim. But on the other hand, if he could show one instance, one reference for one of these 10 jurors, these black jurors that have been struck, then Mumia, Judge Yon would have to give him a new trial. But the thing that everybody around here is so afraid of is that if Mumia gets a new trial, Mumia walks. He didn't do it the first time. And now he's got good lawyers. He's got the best lawyers. He'd never get convicted of this twice. He didn't do it the first time. It was a frame-up job, and this would be so easy for an intelligent lawyer, a competent lawyer, to show. Plus, they claim that their number one witness, Cynthia White's dead, which no, I'm not so sure about that, but they, don't have, they didn't have a case against him then without her, and they sure wouldn't have a case against him now. The Third Circuit had a decision to make. Do they want this man to actually walk free? Because that's what they would have said. If they'd have said, uh, you get your bats in claim, and we find that the court finds that Ju uh, Prosecutor McGill did use race reasons to exclude jurors, Mumia would have walked. There must be a lot riding in this state on him not walking. Well, you know, you just have to look at the governor's office, right? I mean, he, district attorney at the time, Ed Rendell. Yeah, there's a lot to that. Uh, and on our, in our own Supreme Court here in Pennsylvania, you've got Ron Castile, who was on the DA's office at the time. He signed a number of the things against Mumia. And yet he still, every time the Supreme Court takes up this case, refuses to recuse himself from it, votes against Mumia every chance he gets. Rendell's governor, his, uh, one of his protégés, Lynn Abraham, who was the one who had Mumia's bedside in the hospital, issued the crime warrant, the warrant for his arrest right there at the hospital. You know, like a lot of cases you'd go to, well, 30, you know, 26 years go by, everybody changes. But they haven't changed it here. You still got the, you know, Rendell's higher up than he was then, Lynn Abraham is higher up than they were then, and they've all made this tremendous commitment of actually trying to kill this one man. They want him dead. Governor Ridge, when he ran on a part of his campaign, was the same thing. He was going to out. He was going to out Rendell. Rendell. He ran on a ran on a partial platform of signing as soon as he could sign the death warrant for Mumia's execution. And by God, he did. And not in your book, but in the essay you've written since your book is, um, was was printed. Um, you look at all these um, uh, statements of fact that um, the judges put in. Just basic things, this witness said this, the crime happened like this. So much of it was wrong. You, in your essay, you, you point out all these errors. A judge is supposed to really rely on the record. The, the record, i.e. the transcripts, the statements. The record is really what you have when you're a judge. And he showed a, he didn't, he didn't really carefully examine the record because he had so many mistakes in his, this is a preliminary part of the decision where they, we, uh, they, you know, they recycle the case. They restate the main points about a case. He was wrong repeatedly on what it, on the basic facts of the case. So it just showed me that he had given kind of a cavalier, I mean, a very cavalier. Uh, he had a very cavalier attitude toward the record itself. His mind was made up. But then he, his big challenge, it looked to me like this, the concoct some reason, how can he stop Mumia's Batson claim? So they go out in left field here and they break their own precedent and come up with this. If you don't know the whole jury pool's racial makeup, then you can't have a Batson claim. You know, expand, you know, 
taking the Supreme Court law, the U.S. Supreme Court law, and shoving it aside and saying, we know better than you do. We've got a new qualification. You never, the Supreme Court didn't have this qualification, but we're going to get, we're going to make a new qualification to keep this man from getting a Batson hearing. Yeah. I mean, it's like a vendetta to me. That's the only way I can, only way I can see it. Because normally you try to be respectful of judges. I mean, you really should be. But in this case, you lose your respect. One, when they don't pay any attention to the record, they foul up the record, they besmirch the record, misstate it, and then go against one of their own precedents. It's only a three-year-old precedent. Rule exactly the opposite to keep one man from getting justice. I am absolutely innocent of the charge I was charged of. I'm absolutely not guilty of the charges I were convicted of.